This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cooty, and Husker Radio Network analyst, Jeremiah Searles. Welcome in to another victory episode of the Sideline Slice presented by Valentino's Pizza alongside Jeremiah Searles. I'm Jessica Cooty and uh, Searles people were joking that I was going to maybe have to give you a sedative for this podcast today. You're going to be so fired up. I mean, I definitely got home at like midnight and I don't think I fell asleep till like two in the morning <laughs> after that game. I mean, I was just so excited and buzzed and wired and I mean, I got to watch sad Terrell Owens on the sideline, sad <laughs> Warren Sapp. I mean, I got to stand on the CU sideline and just watch them melt down in epic fashion. And if I could just relive that moment over and over and over again, I would die a happy man because there was nothing better than watching Travis Hunter and Shadur Sanders and all those dudes like yelling at each other going back. And I was just sitting there like, excellent, more, more. <laughs> and then to go watch the black shirts back up everything they talked about during the week. And they weren't talking trash during the week. They were just making statements about what they were going to do. And then they go out there and absolutely shove it up. Shadur's <laughs> side. I'm, I'm sorry. It's just, it was so much fun to be part of a Husker football win like that and to be in the stadium and to hear the environment and to just watch the team play the way they did, especially in the first half, was just so much fun to be back around winning Husker football. Yeah, I was joking. I, I was telling the people in the chat on Sports Nightly last night, and then I was talking with Greg on, during the broadcast. I'm like, I saw Searles at halftime, and he is pretty fired up. <laughs> you, you were pretty fired up at half. It was 28 to nothing, and just about everything going, uh, every, you couldn't really have asked for a better start, right? Uh, especially there in, in the first two series, the way that Ty Robinson set the tone defensively, and then you go score an offensive touchdown. I mean, you couldn't have scripted out much better, right, than, than what the Huskers did on, on Saturday. Absolutely. I mean, the first, the first 30 minutes of football were a thing of beauty. I mean, it was complimentary football. It was doing what we needed to do, playing within the scheme on both sides of the ball. Bushini is a weapon on the punt game. I mean, everything was clicking. And even some of the things that in the last couple of years, the ball hasn't bounced our way. Right, And I'm not about saying that like you create your own luck, but you kind of do sometimes. And to have a ball that was a batted up ball, could have been a pick, should have maybe been a pick, but it falls right into Ramirez's hands and he runs into the end zone. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that it just it hasn't bounced our way in the last couple of years. And so to have a bounce go our way, to have a pick six go our way, to not turn the ball over, like all those things are creating ourselves in good positions, creating some good luck for ourselves. And I mean, that's about as good of a half of football that I can remember the Huskers ever playing in the last 10 years. So we are going to uh, dive in a, a little bit, not as much of a breakdown today and preview because we've got a special guest coming up here in just a few minutes, going to be joining us on the pod. But I guess, you know, you, you broke down some of the positives, but if you had to just pick out number one, what was the best thing you saw on Saturday in the win over Colorado? What, what would it be for you? It's our defensive front. It's the way that our defensive front knew they needed to take over the football game, talked about it all week, talked about being a dominant force, and then executed it on Saturday. I mean, from the word go, that D-line was on Shadur like white on rice. I mean, he could not breathe back there. And it wasn't just one guy. Everyone took their turn. It was Jamari Butler. It was Cam Lenhart. It was Ty Robinson. It was Nash Hutmiker. It was Mackay. I mean, you just, you just looked around, and that dude was never comfortable in the pocket. He couldn't escape out of the pocket. I mean, we talked about on the show last week, you had to be disciplined in your rush games with Shadur because where does he hurt you? It's when he gets outside and can create down the field. And they just played such sound football. I mean, there probably was no one happier in that building than Terrence Knighton. I mean, we knew last year he was going to feast. I called it this year he was going to feast in me more. And I know we didn't have as many sacks as we did last year, but I think we got after Shadur in a much more effective way this year than we did even the year before. Mm. And you, you had talked about this, too, that it, it was going to take more than just the defensive line. And I thought this was great, too, after the game when I was talking to the defensive linemen. They were quick to say, listen, we, we couldn't have done it without the guys in the back in the secondary doing their job, too. So you, you got to give a hats off, too, to, to those defensive backs and, and the way that they matched up against those wide receivers. And Tommy Hill gets the pick six. And so uh, overall, and you said that's going to be a big key, too. So how did you feel like the, the secondary played on Saturday? Yeah, you know, it, it obviously helps playing from a big lead. 
right? You don't have to be as pressed up. You can keep everything in front of you. And Travis Hunter did have over 100 yards, but that was more of a scheme thing than him just tearing us apart, right? You just kept everything in front of you. No one over the back of your head. You knew the ball was going to have to come out quick with the way that our defense was getting after it. And again, no one on that defense tried to press and make something happen. They just all played within the scheme. Tony White pulled a great game plan together. He knew where he wanted to push and where he wanted to attack. He knew when he wanted to pull back and play coverage. And if you have 11 guys so bought into the scheme that they just allow the plays to come to them and they allow the things to happen to them, that's winning football. That's how you put complete games together. That's how you take the football away. You know, and we're going to need to continue to do that. I can't think of the last time through two games that the Huskers have been positive in the turnover margin. Right, we've only given it up once. We've taken it away four times, three times. I can't. I don't four. think the exact yeah, number. Yeah, four. Right, so we're plus three in the turnover margin. That's a huge step in the right direction from a program standpoint. Right, I mean, we were minus three in the first half last year. Right, so we're taking right steps in the right direction. Obviously, the second half, there's a ton that we need to get cleaned up that wasn't up to the standard for the offensive side of the ball. But I mean, the jump from week one to week two was where I wanted to see it, and I'm really excited to see where week two to week three takes us. Two defensive scores, uh, two weeks in a row, too. Gotta love that. Mm, gotta um, lo- that pick six was top three loudest I've ever heard Memorial Stadium. I mean, yeah. when when Tommy Hill took that ball and just waltzed into the end zone there, that place. Erupted. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's when Colorado was done. Uh, watching Shadur stand there like a pouty child in the end zone as he watched Tommy Hill high step into the end zone is another <laughs> highlight of the day. Okay, let's uh, flip things over to the offensive side of the ball. And, um, you know, Dante Dowdell gets the majority, mm. uh, the bulk of the carries. And, you know, we were talking last week and, and you made note of his physicality and, and how physically he runs the football he's not afraid to get physical and you were fired up about it and I could see it on the sideline how how fired up the offensive line were by by his running do you feel like it was a matchup thing for Dante or um you know why do you think it was that he was the guy that that ended up they they rolled with on Saturday I think that you know he got the first opportunity because of his effectiveness in week one and he just continued to roll with that you know I think he's our most complete back when you talk about a physical standpoint, understanding how to run the reads, understanding when to press the hole, and then also having the ability to bounce things to the outside and make the one unblocked guy in the corner miss or run right through him and continue to run forward in positive yards. He did a great job of responding to the call of Matt Rule of do not turn the football over. You know, I saw great ball security from him, two hands through contact, running with his pads over his knees and falling forward. And, you know, I think he separated himself a little bit from the pack. But then you talk about Ramir Johnson came in, played really well too. Gabe Urban had some big runs at the end. Again, we have a plethora of riches in that running back room. And that's a great thing to have. It's a great thing to, that going into this week. But, you know, I would love to see some more consistency from our running game in the second half to be matched up a little bit more with what it looked like in the first half. Overall, how would you, I guess, grade out, evaluate the offensive line and, and what they were able to, to do? Yeah, I, you know, I think in the first half they were doing a great job of moving and running guys off the ball and keeping CU on their, on their heels of what they wanted to do. Um, but also, you know, I think that we need to do a better job of adjusting to things in the second half. You know, CU made some really good adjustments at halftime of, hey, we're going to blitz the two linebackers in the A-gap to get these guys off their double teams quicker, to allow more one-on-one blocks. And, you know, they won some of those matchups more in the second half. So as good as they played in the first half, you know, once they went more into that downhill blitz scheme because they knew we were going to run the football, there wasn't quite as much push up the middle. And so that's something that we need to address because other teams are going to watch this tape. They're going to study what CU did in the second half. I mean, they shut us out. Right? We, didn't, we didn't score another touchdown um, in the second half. And so, you know, you're going to want to address those things because any good defensive coordinator is going to look at that film and they're going to copycat it and say, did Nebraska fix this? Right. And so that's on Satterfield. That's on Coach Rayola. And that's on those guys up front to go, okay, if this is how teams want to play us, we can't allow that to affect us. We still have to be a dominant front. We still have to move guys. We still have to create running lanes for these backs because if that shows that we kind of make ourselves one dimensional when teams do that, they're going to start throwing a lot more blitzes at us on first and second down. You know, one of the things that uh, Coach Rule brought up in his press conference about, you know, there's figuring out how to play winning football and then there's playing championship football and and we're playing winning football we're not playing championship winning football 
Um, you know, how do you get to that point as a player when you are on the sidelines and you feel like you're playing championship football and you can beat anybody you, you line up against? Yeah, no matter you know, the situation, too, and overcoming, you know, the adversity that comes throughout a game, too. Yeah, first of all, you can't put yourself behind the sticks. Right? You, you can't be in first and 15. You can't have 112 yards of penalties. Right? That's not championship football by any stretch of the imagination. When you play against teams that are championship caliber teams, right? Ohio State's, Michigan's, um, you know, USC, those type of teams. You look across the country at the teams like Texas and UCLA, or not, excuse me, Texas and Georgia. You look at them and go, man, they're very disciplined in how they run their offense and how they're not getting holding penalties and doing those things. We need to get to that aspect if we want to put ourselves in the championship caliber. And a lot of that is just being disciplined in your technique and disciplined in your fundamentals that you're not putting yourself in a position to get a holding penalty or you're not putting yourself in a position to give up a sack because you took a bad set or, you know, or you're putting yourself in a position because you ran the wrong route. Those type of little details compound over the course of a game that can lead to winning and losing football. And right now we're on the winning side of it because we've been able to overcome some of those things. But as your talent level goes up in your opponent, as we get deeper into the year, those little things continue to matter more and more and more. And so rule notices it. A lot of us on the sideline, former players, you know, me, Divino Zigbo, Kenny Bell, Will Compton, we all noticed it, right? Guys who played in the league. And those things have to continue to get cleaned up so that they don't rear their ugly head in October or November when the games matter even more. And, you know, those are the type of little things that hurt us in the second half. You know, he had also mentioned, too, he talked about the, the blocking by the wide receivers on the outside not good enough either, that that has to make some improvements there. How, how much can those wide receivers improve? How much can that improve from week to week when you're talking about that, something, that being something that needs to improve in a hurry? Yeah, you know, as big as these wide receivers are and as much as our identity is going to want to be of a running football team, you got to go out and match up on these corners and these safeties and put a body on a body. I'm not saying you got to murder these guys, right? I'm not saying you got to be a George Kittle or a Debo Samuel and drive these dudes into the dirt. So much of blocking on the perimeter is about locking up and running your feet, right? Because one thing as a receiver, you'd never really know when the ball's going to bounce to you or you never really know when the ball's going to get to behind you so you don't have eyes in the back of your head. So much of it is getting in front of your man and just mirroring your man and not stopping your feet because the second you stop your feet on the perimeter and there's nobody around you besides you and the defender and the ball's right behind you and the ref's looking right at you, it's really easy because you don't know which way the back's going to just tug on a jersey or if you stop your feet and he's trying to fall off and make a tackle, it looks like a hold. So, so much of the issues that those guys had was just not continuing to drive their feet through contact. And guess what? That's a super easy fix. Mm -hmm. That's not like going back to the drawing board and being like, oh my gosh, how do we block these guys on the perimeter? You know, there's a ton of drills you can do for it and a ton of reps and majority of it is just desire and want to. I mean, desire and want to is the number one thing I look for out of a wide receiver when he's blocking. Is he giving effort and is he just going to try and stay on this guy and stay glued to this guy? And, you know, if I know anything about, you know, our wide receivers coach and coach rule and Satterfield, like, they're not going to let these guys get away without having the desire and the effort. And I think they have the desire and the effort. They just got to pick it up to another level. What do you make of uh, Coach Rule talking this week about Dylan Riola's preparation and that it's a challenge to the rest of the offense that they need to, to pick it up and be as prepared as he is? I love that. No one should be more prepared than your quarterback. And I don't care if he's 17 years old, 18 years old, or 35 years old. No one should be more prepared than your quarterback. That's his job. That's what he's done. He is the general of your offense, and he will go, and the offense will go as far as he goes. And so if Coach Rule's saying that the offense has to pick it up to the level of a true freshman, pick it up, boys. <laughs> you, can't, you, you, can't let, you can't go out there and have this guy being so well-prepared that you're letting the 18-year-old down. That needs, to be, that needs to change very quickly. And I love that Coach Rule said that publicly because he didn't throw anyone under the bus. He didn't single anyone out. He challenged everyone else and if you're challenged as an elite athlete you should rise to that challenge you should never cower away from it never back down never be like oh well he said we need to be better no no you rise up and you say all right 
You want to challenge me? I'll show you what happens when you challenge me. I'm going to perform at an even higher level. And that's what Coach Rule did. He challenged those guys. And so I am really, really excited to come out and watch this game on Saturday to see what guys rose to the challenge what guys didn't. Because there are going to be some guys that just don't rise to that challenge. But guess what? There's enough depth on this team that there's going to be guys that Coach Rule is not afraid to put in. If you're not putting in the effort in the film room, you're not putting in the effort in the weight room or any of that stuff to be as prepared as, your eight, as number 15 is. Uh, special teams also, uh, you know. Oh. <laughs> what? Ooh. What? Thought you were going to bring it up. I, that, was, that was scary. Special teams was scary. Ruscini's great. Our long snapper and our operation was not good by any stretch of the imagination. If there was one glaring issue of this game, Jess, it was our special teams. Right? We, we, our operation from a standpoint of punt and our, our field goals was not, not, up to, not up to par by any stretch of the imagination. How quickly can that get fixed? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, I want to say that as a long snapper, you should be able to get the ball back there. And I don't know if it's a confidence thing. I don't know if it was just, you know, just an off night. But, I mean, the pump block was 100% on the slow operation between the snap and the kick. You know, the missed field goal was based off of a, a bad operation between snapper and holder. You know, so those type of things, those, those will cost you games as you get moving forward. You know, getting a pump blocked is not acceptable. That can't be happening. That's a momentum changer. It's a field changer. You know, those type of things cannot happen if you want to move forward. So, you know, Rule's going to address that this week. I think the team's going to really address that this week, and that's a big aspect because you can't win football games with only two phases, offense and defense. Special teams is such a huge phase of a football game. Especially, too, in the Big Ten. I mean, how many guys... Yes, and, and Buscini's such a weapon. Yeah. I mean, he's such a weapon. I mean, that dude has a howitzer for a leg. You know, and he... <laughs> He shoots them high, and they're good, and they're in the right direction. They're going where they need to go. Get him the ball quicker so he can be even more of a weapon for us going forward. I love today I, I chatted with Jamari Butler, and um, I brought up, you know, the pick six, and he goes, you know, what, what nobody's talking about is we don't have that opportunity without Bushini mm -hmm. nailing the punt to the two-yard line. So he was quick to point out, yeah, we can talk about John Bullock and what he did to allow Tommy to make the play to get into the end zone and us pressuring, but really it, none of it happens without Buscini doing his job. Yeah, I mean, you nailed it. In the Big Ten, you want to make offenses have to go 99 yards, right? You're just talking about flipping field position and having to get 10 first downs to get all the way down there to score a touchdown or put your five first downs, six first downs to get yourself in field goal range. Anytime you make an offense have to do that, more times than not, the defense is going to find success. And so being a punt and a kickoff, you know, as a weapon for us is going to be critical as we go down the stretch. Okay, let's uh, quickly just dive into to this week. Um, you know, I know that it seems like that this team is pretty hungry and they are going into the mindset of 1-0 and every week. But, you know, as a player, can you – Take us into what it's like coming off a win against a team like Colorado and then now going into this week and, and how you manage that and the emotions of that. And, um, you know, again, I, I feel like this team will handle it well just because they are pretty bought in and hungry. But I got to imagine that sometimes that it, it can be a little bit of a getting yourself up for something after coming off a win like Colorado. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's Newton's law. What comes up must come down, right? And it's not really fathomable to think that everyone's going to be as hyped up especially I mean just even around the state as they are for the old fighting Panthers from Cedar Falls Iowa to come in here as it was for the celebrity show of the CU game but the trap you can't fall into as a player is not bringing your own energy right because no the stand and the fans are not going to be as energized as it was when you run out on the stand uh, out on the field uh, for this week as it was last week that's okay but you can't fall into that trap player and going 1-0 every week is obviously what you have to set your mind on. But, you know, I thought Rule had a great comment in his press conference about how there's a lot of guys on this football team that got hardened through the hardships of last year and paired with the young guys. And I promise you guys like Ty Robinson and Bryce Benhart and Turner Corcoran and Nash and John Bullock who have been here through the hard years, they're not satisfied with being 2-0. They're not like, oh, we've arrived because we're 2-0. and And those are the guys you need to lean on as a coaching staff, as a young player, and those are the guys that are going to drive this team forward to not get comfortable, 
to not be complacent because these type of games, they're not trap games, but they're obvious. T- there's games in here where you're going, okay, this is a lesser opponent. We should be able to go and take care of business. But that doesn't mean that you have to prepare any different. That doesn't mean that you practice any different. That doesn't mean that you play any different. You know, if you start going and you start rising to the level of your opponent each and every week, where it's like, okay, we're playing see you this week so we're really geared up and then we're playing northern iowa this way so we're going to take it easy this week and then you start riding that yo-yo eventually it's going to fall apart and you're going to get punched in the mouth but if you continue to prepare and mindset and do everything regardless of who you're playing every single week that's where you start becoming a really championship level football team great stuff so what will be some of the things that you're looking for then in this matchup against you and i uh, before, again, this is the last one before you go into Big Ten play, an Illinois team that looked pretty solid last week and also a mm-hmm. quick turnaround on a Friday night. So what are some of the things that you feel like uh, you need to see that need to happen for this team uh, on Saturday? Yeah, I would love for us offensively to continue to get more comfortable running the football for all four quarters, right? Continue to get more of that dominant presence, continuing not to let anyone go and to really understand when to put the foot down and have the killer mindset, right? We had CU in the corner, on the ropes at halftime, begging for mercy, and we let them get off the mat a little bit, right? We let them get back up, and they went down and scored, and they moved the football, and we couldn't get first downs, right? And we let them kind of feel like they had some life. I want us to look like we did week one, and when we've got an opponent down on the mat after body blow after body blow, we chop off the head, right? It's done. Like they're, they're, he's never getting back up. And that falls on our offensive line and our running backs and our tight ends of just leaning on guys for four quarters and understanding that, yeah, it might be four yards in the first quarter. It might be six yards in the second quarter. But then by the fourth quarter, because we've just been leaning on guys, that's 12, 14, 16, 20-yard explosive runs. I want to see us do more of that this week. And then defensively, I would love for us to not have to show any more out of the bag. Right, We showed some last week. We still didn't blitz a ton. But I would love for us to go into Big Ten play with a ton of tricks and a ton of stuff left in the bag that we didn't put on tape because we were able to rely on guys like Ty Robinson and Nash. And if John Bullock can keep playing at this level, he's putting himself in contention for an all-Big Ten type of selection. He played a fantastic football game last week. And so just to rely on those guys to play within the scheme and not have to pull a bunch of stuff out on third down because we're able to get pressure and get off the field with just playing our base defense. So you kind of just hit on it there, but I guess uh, quickly give us your, your three biggest keys for this one. Yeah, uh, again, zero turnovers. I'd love to walk into Big Ten play with just having one turnover, right? One turnover there. So taking care of the football, continue to make good reads with Dylan Rayola, taking good ball security with whoever carries the football there, offensive line, not having any type of strip sacks or anything like that. You know, so continuing to take care of the football on offense, cleaning up our special teams is a big key this week. Right, getting some more live action reps at that on punt, punt return, kickoff and kick return and field goal. Right, good operations, good snaps, good, good holds, good execution across the board. And then three, don't come out flat. Come out with a lot of energy. Right, come out hungry, come out excited, come out with a ton of energy and jump on this team from the rip. Right, these FCS teams, this is their Super Bowl. Right, they're never gonna play. A lot of these guys will never play in front of a crowd like they're going to play in again in front of Memorial Stadium on Saturday night. Don't let them feel like they have life. And I've been part of these games where we had to inch out a game against South Dakota State because we came out thinking, oh, we're going to pop pads at halftime. I'll have some Valentinos in my mouth by the third quarter as a starter. And then here we are in a dogfight in the fourth quarter because we allowed this team to hang around. You come out with energy and you jump on this team early, they don't have the talent to come back. They just don't. Right, So I would love to see us have a smothering performance again on all three phases. I might add to that, too. Not just the energy out of the gate, but also coming out of, ha- out of half, too, right? Mm. Yes, that's a great point. You know, making sure that you go into halftime, and even if you're up by a bunch of scores, you come back out, and there's, again, chop off the head. Right? Don't allow them to get back up off the mat. Just continue to smother. Give them no life. Give them not an inch, and just continue to pour points up on the board. Okay, so we're going to do something a little bit different today. We've got a special guest joining us, so stick around. We've got a fun conversation with a great friend to the podcast coming up next, so keep it right here. Valentino's treasured Italian family recipes passed down for generations. Valentino's has become Nebraska's classic Italian tradition and proudly served in Memorial Stadium for over 30 years. 
As we welcome you back to the sideline slice with Searles, Jessica Cooty, Jeremiah Searles, and man, a great friend of ours, a great partner to the Huskers Radio Network, and our sponsor here, Anthony Messinio with Valentino's. We, we talk about you guys all the time. We're big fans around here, and so uh, you're going to join us for a little bit and, and chat a little bit with us here on the pod. Absolutely, and, and I'm a big fan of, uh, of the pod. Love uh, Faithful listener, obviously, every week, and it's great. Well, Happy we, to be here. We thank you guys for making this possible. And, Searles, just FYI, he came bearing gifts, so you are missing out. Dessert pizza mm. that you are not <laughs> going to get to partake in. You see that? That's just mean. Can that's you smell just, it? Can you smell I, that's, it? That's just my stomach is grumbling just <laughs> looking at that. I mean, especially since I know that you are gonna, just going to give it away. Well, so it's like, do I? No, I'm not going to eat all of it. I love I know, dessert but you, pizza. I know you're just going to start handing it to people, and usually I try and steal like half of it and take you it do. home. You do. You me. take it home to the and kids, some too. Ross actually. Well, that's just my excuse. I just tell you I'm taking it home to the kids. <laughs> half the time it doesn't even make it home. Like uh, I eat it in the car like a rat. They gave us an option between apple and cherry. I let since you weren't going to be here, I let Russ pick, so he went with the apple today. But you like both, right? I love both, but the cherry one is elite. I mean, it's <laughs> the cherry. The cherry one speaks dirty things in my ears. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. That's my favorite one as well. So, uh, it's so good. So we always love it. We were. Uh, Searles, I was telling him, too, that when you were filling in for Sports Nightly, Carla, one of our favorite listeners, actually sends us vows uh, that we, we yes. eat on during the, the shows. Yeah, I know. That's kind of why I fill in on Sports Nightly anymore. It's just like <laughs> I know I'm going to get a free meal from Carla every single time, so it's just perfect. Well, uh, very, very special. Valentino is obviously the sponsor of this podcast, but also the official pizza of the Huskers, as we say every week. But celebrating 30 years that you yeah. guys have been baking and selling pizzas inside Memorial Stadium. Wow. Can, can you believe that it's been 30 years? It's gone by quick, but yeah, happy to celebrate our 30th anniversary of being the official pizza of the Huskers and making and baking a lot of pizzas here for game day. Why has it been so important for you guys to keep the partnership going for so long? Well, we've just worked with so many great people over the years. And, uh, you know, it's been key for us to, one, obviously, Husker football is a huge Nebraska tradition. And our first location was on East Campus, right across from the university. And, you know, it, uh, when the opportunity came to us in early 94, uh, we just said, well, we've, we've got to do what we can to be in there. And first couple seasons, everything was going good. Then it's just really grown. Yeah. And you guys were the first year. I mean, we just celebrated last weekend the 94 National Championship team. So you guys might have had a little something to do with it. That, the special magic that year. There's that magic. Yep. <laughs> Starting in 94. That's right. So you, oh, go ahead, how, many, how many pizzas, like whole pizzas, <laughs> get sold at a game day? Like ballpark. So we sell, you know, it depends on game time, but if it's lunch or dinner time, we'll sell about 22,000 slices of pizzas, so over 2,500 pizzas, because we, we take our big jumbo pizza, yeah. cut into the eight slices, and then it goes into that little magical slice box, and, uh, and every, you know, and uh, we've got several kitchens here, so. Wow. A, a lot of pizzas, a lot of Husker fans. Yeah. How many That's slices awesome. of pizza could you eat, Searles? Infinity. I mean, <laughs> in one very, sitting. There's, few, there's very few foods in my life that I think I could just never get tired of. And pizza is 100% one of them. It doesn't matter if it's hamburger, pepperoni, cheese. Like, I love pizza. <laughs> it's like my all-time favorite food. Okay, so it's a process, though, for you guys. Can you take us through the week? It's not just, take sure. hey, game day. What, what goes into you guys getting ready to sell 22,000 sure. slices of pizza? Really, early in the summer, we start our planning meetings, and, you know, we check the schedule, game times. And then, but game week, you know, where everything's getting cleaned up during the week for the kitchens, the products, you know, all the, our pizza sauce, our you know, the mozzarella cheese, uh, the meats are all being brought down, uh, getting everything ready to go. And then really production starts. Uh, we start making, getting things ready really Thursday, Friday. And then um, we like to start baking off pizzas a little bit before the gates open up so all the stands can be ready to go. But, uh, you know, we have about 100 people down here on game day uh, with our different kitchens and volunteers that are... Uh, making this thing work. Wow. 
And you guys have people that have worked for you since you became the official right, pizza of the Huskers, right? right? We, we kind of look back at that. We just have such a, well, we, we couldn't do this without our just amazing staff and managers and supervisors that have been really a uh, part of this since uh, game one in 94. Yeah. Wow. We talk about a classic family recipe and the tradition behind yeah. Valentino's and you know, when you look at just across the country, there's all these change. But so what does it mean to you guys? And then also, I know the university thinks the world of you guys that this partnership has lasted so long and, and you guys are, have started born and raised right here in Nebraska. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, yeah, we, you know, we say we're, part of our slogan is Nebraskans proudly serving Nebraskans. Yeah. And, um, you know, that goes back to 1957. And then obviously our partnership here in 94. And it does. We take a lot of pride in that. It's a, you know, we we feel a strong connection there with with the university. They've been a great partner of ours, and but you know we've heard from different administrations or stuff to have a uh, slice of pizza be your biggest concession item uh, mm -hmm. across the board for Husker sports is is really kind of unique, and um, um, so we just. Uh, you know, obviously we're happy to celebrate, but just a big thank you to the fans for 30 great years. Awesome. I, I, will, I will say one of my fonder memories of playing for the Huskers is we were beating, I believe it was Idaho State. And we had like, I was done in like the second quarter. And I can remember sneaking a piece of pizza onto the sideline <laughs> as I was still playing and like hiding in the corner, like eating it over by the Gatorade stand. And that's one of the few times that, like, that was the first time I had Valentino's inside Memorial Stadium, except for when I came on my visit. And I don't know about you, but it just tastes different in Memorial Stadium. Like, it's there's just something that's just that nice, like, feels like home when you're eating a piece of pizza in Memorial Stadium. I don't know. It just hits differently. You know, Jeremiah could be the best Valentino spokesperson oh, that we've ever had I'm over starving. 65 I'm years. I'm starving, dude. You guys <laughs> wave this dessert pizza in front of me, and I'm at home. I'm trying to lose weight, and now all I can think about is eating Memorial Stadium pizza. Well, we'll be ready for you on Saturday. Hey, he oh. needs an NIL deal with you guys. Absolutely. He'd probably, yes. he'd probably just do it for pizza, though. Free pizza, yeah, and free dessert free, pizza. Free, yeah, just but you product, know, we guys. do hear that cash. from a lot of people that, gosh, I my favorite way to have Val's you know, they get the care out delivery or uh, dine in, but I do think it's something with that slice that comes right out of the oven. Mm. It goes right in that slice box and it steams in there. And really, most slices that you're getting in the stadium are probably half an hour outside of an oven. So wow. they're going right in those hawker boxes, Talk right dirty. to the stands, and uh, right back uh, to, to the customers. You know, we also have this thing called Victory Vowels. And in fact, Greg <laughs> uh, texted uh, uh, Searles and I after the game and said, boy, Victory Vowels taste good. I never get to be involved in that because I'm not up in the press box. But Searles, tell us about Victory Vowels. Yeah, so when I started doing sideline in 21, I think it was, I would always come up after the games to do the, the fifth quarter show with old Benny McLaughlin. And anytime we would win... Um, at Memorial Stadium, they always bring vows up for the press writers, the scribes and pundits up in the top. And we'd always sit in there after we finished the fifth quarter show and we'd just be sitting there, me, Greg, and Ben just waiting and talking about the game and be like, we'd always take Charles, like, who's going to go check at Vows this year next? And like, you'd <laughs> pop your head out and you could just smell it the second the door opened. So you'd open and be like, not here yet. And so we'd be sitting there and then 10 minutes would go by and be like, someone go check. And we'd be here and someone pop the door and be like, victory Vows! And then we'd run out and go grab a bunch of slices and come back in. And that's how we used to, to end our Husker game days after wins in the press box. Well, let's keep that tradition going. Yeah, more mm -hmm. victory Vows. We, every, every home game, let's have victory Vows. You know, just uh, you had talked a little bit about thanking Nebraskans, but just even outside of the stadium, too, uh, you know, the fact that you guys have had this much support from the state and, and that you guys have been able to be for so long and have so much success. Uh, what do you think is the key to that, and, and what has that meant to you guys? Well, it's just been so special for us. And, you know, I always say when we talk to customers or if I'm in one of our stores or wherever it might be, I really truly believe Nebraskans feel a sense of ownership of Valentino's. It's it's their brand. It's their, you know, it's their pizza. I know there's other pizza places that just do a fantastic job in the state, but I think us going back to 1957, they truly, I think, feel that they uh, they have a, you know, no pun intended, but a piece 
<laughs> of who we are is, is really uh, special to us. A slice of who you are. Yes, absolutely. Hey, uh, well, what do you think about the football team and the start to the season? Well, I'm happy to be on this week. What a great first <laughs> couple of weeks. It's been fantastic. I, you know, luckily made the first two games and uh, that Colorado game, that was uh, people, that was a loud, loud atmosphere. That was just amazing. After that pick six and everything, I think people were just uh, hungry for a win. Do you get a chance to watch many of the games or much yeah, of the action? I yeah, I try to get out and watch, uh, catch some of that game for sure. Was that one of the loudest atmospheres you've, you've heard? Oh, hands down. Yeah. I mean, there's been so many great games. I mean, I go back to, you know, I was thinking about that on the way here. I mean, I remember one of my first games was coming to my dad with my dad when Mike Rogier did that big reverse run against UCLA. And I remember how loud that was. And there's just been so many great moments over the years. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for all that you guys do, for being such a great partner, and for sponsoring our pod so Absolutely. we can get on here and talk Oscar football every week. Oh, thank you. You two are magnificent. You guys do a great job, and uh, can't wait to listen uh, week after week and get the Val celebrations going. So when we, mm. we say, when we talk about Anthony, you guys now, our listeners and viewers, now have a, a face and a voice with the name. And so uh, we appreciate you guys so much. And, um, yeah, thanks for listening to this episode of the Sideline Slice, brought to you by our great friends at Valentino's, the official pizza of the Huskers. For Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cootie. Go Big Red. You want to say a Go Big Red? Oh, let's do a Go Big Red. <laughs> there it is. I love it. Got to end the pod with a Go Big Red. <laughs>